call into order. I don't have a gavel. <laughs> Pretend to call to order the meeting. Uh, yeah, no, Paul, here we go. Uh, the policy committee meeting, October 17th, 2017. Um, we first have, uh, our chair is at a conference today, so I'm filling in as, as the meeting moderator for today. Um, first on discussion on my, my agenda is DBC, the Annual Operating Budget Development and Option Revision Funding Model Review. Good afternoon. You can introduce yourselves, please. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Courtney Desabay. I'm the Special Assistant to the Chief Financial Officer. Good afternoon. I'm Mary Ann Cox. I'm the Deputy CFO. Can you pull the microphones a little bit closer? I'm, we're not hearing you very well. Sure. Is that a little bit better? Can you say it again? Uh, uh, I'm Mary Ann Cox. I'm the Dep Deputy Chief Financial Officer. Uh, so the policy we have um, in front of us here is a policy update to the regular budget operating budget policy. Um, it's pretty brief. Um, in this, what we're proposing is that we would do a review of the funding model at least once every four years. Um, so that's not currently stated in the existing um, operating budget policy, so it would just be an amendment to the policy. So. First slide we have is the background. Purpose of the policy is to ensure that city schools provides all students with appropriate support through the responsible distribution of funding resources. As resource availability and fiscal climate shift periodically, it's become necessary to review the process for allocating those resources at a regular interval. So what we're suggesting is that, um, as we well know, the fiscal climate changes fairly frequently. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in control. I didn't realize it. Yes, the, the fiscal climate is changing really fairly recently and fairly quickly, and we want the policy to reflect that. We want to be able to adjust the funding model on a regular basis, at least every four years, to reflect whatever changes are taking place outside of city schools as well. Could you do me a favor to speak a little bit louder? I don't know what's going on, but but I'm certainly I'm barely hearing you. You speaking softly, maybe? Is this any better? better. All right. Yes. Um, I'm not sure how much of that you caught, so I'll repeat. Please. Um, yes, I was saying the purpose of the policy is to review the funding model that we use for distribution and allocation of funds uh, at least once every four years. So uh, as I mentioned, as we can see, um, there's a lot of things changing in the fiscal landscape outside the district, so the policy is meant to keep us abreast with that so the funding model, model does not become outdated. Um, so that's what's stated in the challenges, is the fact that the current um, operating budget policy does not include uh, uh, a provision for any updates, so we would like to include that right now. Uh, so far, we've contacted um, PCAB and the Charter Advisory Board for feedback. Um, PCAB has asked us to attend their November 7th meeting and would like one of us um, from finance to speak on this policy to get some feedback. And additionally, we would like to seek um, additional stakeholders from the board or any other parties that the board thinks that we should be reaching out to for feedback. We would like to do so as well. This is a specific section in the policy that would be the addition. So this is in section four of the DBC policy. So at least once every four years as part of the budget development process, the CEO or designee shall perform a review of the funding model used for the distribution of funding resources. In addition, the CEO designee shall present the results of the funding model review to the board for approval. Next, we have the addition to the guidelines uh, in the regulations. So the CFO designee shall organize and develop a review of the funding model used to allocate funding resources to schools at least once every four years as part of the annual budget process. Representatives from the administrative staff shall be involved in the funding model review. The CFO designee shall develop the procedure for the involvement of these representatives. Recommendations for modifications to the funding model shall be made to the CEO based on the outcome of the review. And these recommendations shall be presented to the board upon completion of the review. That's it. Are there any questions? Does that conclude your presentation? I'm sorry. That does conclude That's my it. presentation. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, do, you, do you have any questions, Mr. Berkeley? Okay. No. No. Clear. Makes okay. sense. So Commissioner Hassan uh, typed questions for me, so I'm just going to read them sure. if you could indulge me for just a moment. Um, and the first one, she says, does the committee have recommendations 
on for slide. Slide four, where you talked about seeking input from additional stakeholders. Right. She wanted you to clarify who those stakeholders would be. She recommends here the principal union could be one, Pizzazza, but are, are there other stakeholders that you have decided to reach out to? Do we know who you're engaging? The only ones we've reached out to thus far have been PCAB and the Charter Advisory Board. Um, we're fairly open to other parties at this point. I think it's definitely important that we reach out to the principals and get their feedback on this part of the policy. If we're going to do Pizzazzo, you probably should do BTU as well. Okay. But I think she was looking for uh, additional feedback or comment from the committee or the staff on what kind of stakeholders we could include. But um, if, her, I, okay. if I may, if we're going to reach out to two unions, I suggest that we reach out to all unions. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. I was thinking that in the back of my head that I was saying that. Okay. Yeah. Um, her second question deals with compliance. She asks, how often in the last four years have we gotten a budget amendment? And why she's asking, she's wondering about the use of any amendments in the term terminology in the policy, wondering if that seems burdensome for the CEO. Um, if by amendments we mean um, adjustments to the policy, I take it? Uh, I'm reading her <laughs> questions, unfortunately. I can't clarify that. She literally says, a little bit of the language, any amendments. Okay. Uh, well, I'll assume that she um, is referencing changes to the policy. Budget amendments in our financial terms tend to mean something a little more, a little yeah. different. Yeah. Um, to my knowledge, this is the first proposed uh, change since this particular policy was put in. I, I may be corrected on that, but that's just to my knowledge. Okay. Well, let me finish this. So, so her next question says, well, since it's in the same paragraph, um, if small shifts happen, then it's a choice. Should we put language in about any budget amendment over a certain amount impacting schools or something like that? Maybe that's more clarity than. So what she's saying is, is it about any amount for budget amendments or is it over a certain amount where this policy would become? You mean changes to mm -hmm. a particular the budget. school's um, level of funding? She doesn't say particular oh. school. She says any budget. Should we put in language about any budget amendment over a certain amount? or impacting schools or something like that, meaning we shouldn't just have an amendment for any random number. It should be a, a certain criteria has to be met before we do a budget amendment. Okay. Whether it be an impact, so a significant impact to schools or whether it be a certain dollar amount. I think we may have to follow up with her directly um, to understand the question properly because from what I understand of budget amendments or if we're talking about budget amendments and changing the budget amendments, it's separate from what we're, we're proposing in the policy here. This is just a review of the funding model that we use for allocations to schools in general. So basically how BCPS funds schools. Um, so this does not um, get into the minutia necessarily of individual budget amendments between schools or transactions between schools and central office. It's just when we receive our revenue allocation um, from the state, city, et cetera, or various sources, how we allocate those funds to school. So currently we use the fair student funding model and we have specific weights and um, locked, unlocked positions, et cetera. So what we would do under this proposed review is look again at how we're allocating those weights, look again at how we're determining um, what's locked, what's unlocked, and making sure we're doing an equitable uh, evaluation of how we're funding schools. So it may not necessarily translate to specific budget amendments. It's just in the initial allocation of how schools receive funding, that allocation may be different from how it's currently done under the current model. Okay. So I'm going to email these to you and suggest that um, we work with Margaret Martha directly with them to figure out the answers to her questions to make sure that she's getting the answers that she needs. Um, the last question she had on this is under the regs. She wants to know under D, review of the funding model and the regulations, should this line have more guidance in the initial regulations? Um, I'm not even sure what she's referring to at this point. It's DBC, the reg, regs, 1D, review of funding model, her question is, should this line have more guidance in the initial regulations? So that, that would be what we took out here on slide um, six. So these were the, the guidelines that we listed on the regulations. If there is additional guidelines required, then we can, of course, add those in. Um, okay. Do you want to ask your question? All right, for information purposes, how often, two questions, how often do we evaluate now? Currently, there isn't a policy in place to reevaluate the model. So we do um, minute changes year to year, just okay. depending on the specifics of that year and what we 
you know, what the revenue situation is. But in terms of a wholesale look of how we administer the model, there isn't currently a policy in place to review or make changes to the model. We've been operating with the same model, more or less, um, from since we implemented fair student funding. It's just kind of been um, slightly tweaked year to year individually. Right. So, but I would like to also know, where did you get the four years? I mean, what, how, what? Because of the, um, the, the research and the work involved in the mm -hmm. process in terms of getting community feedback, making changes um, to the model, it's difficult to do it within the constructs of a, one specific um, fiscal year while we're going through the budget process. Uh, so we wanted to be able to incorporate feedback and changes and still develop and test before we implement, which is why we thought a time period of longer than a year would be necessary, but also didn't seem like a process that needs to be repeated on a yearly basis as well. So four years was sort of the, um, the, the number that we came to based on how long we think it would take to implement and how often we thought some of the, the major changes would come into play. Now, it's not limited to be every four years, it's at least once within every four years. So if a major event takes place, you know, two years after the last uh, review, then we are open to doing another review within that period of time. Well, it doesn't mean we have to wait. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I didn't want to, you finished? Yeah, I'm saying it no, doesn't I mean it we... was interesting that you chose four years. I, I've never seen evaluation, a budget evaluation done in a four-year period. It would seem to me, like what you just said, incidents could occur within that four years that might have to be evaluated. And I was wondering if you had studied the possibility of those things happening and where the four years came from. I just was wondering about that. Um, no, we had not studied the possibility of those things happening. It's based largely on our experience with what we've seen over the last couple of years with our fiscal climate. And we thought the four years would be a time period that allow us to incorporate those changes. Okay. So thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next we have uh, JRA maintenance release of student records policy. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Heather Nolan. I'm the Director of Knowledge Management in the Office of Achievement and Accountability. Good afternoon. My name is Ben Goldberg. I'm the Manager of Data Quality, also in Knowledge Management. All right. So we are here to present on a new uh, policy and regulations, which is the Maintenance and Release of Student Records, JRA, JRA, RA for the regulations. Uh, what uh, we want to share with the, um, with the board as well as with the public is that uh, the board uh, as well as city schools recognizes the importance in establishing what the proper procedures uh, are for collecting and maintaining student records. Um, the Office of Achievement and Accountability is the lead for creating this cohesive and coherent plan, uh, but we did work with multiple offices that are responsible for other components of a student's record, which we'll go into more detail as part of this policy review. Again, the purpose of the policy and the regulations is uh, for the district to maintain student records and student records are that which provides key information to students, parents, guardians, as well as professional school personnel for the planning of educational programs for students while they are uh, a member of the Baltimore City uh, family as well as to support their post-secondary opportunities. The policy and administrative regulations are organized as follows. So on the policy end, there's a purpose, there's a list of key definitions. Uh, we review the content of a student record, what the policy standards are, implementation strategies, compliance, and just legal and policy references. The administrative regulations go into much more detail, again, summarizing the purpose but then in the guidelines, we go into details around the retention, the maintenance, transferring disposal of records, digitization, how uh, staff or, or uh, people access student records, how we maintain uh, FERPA, as well as our release of directory information. So again, very comprehensive uh, 
policy and regulations. For the policy, yes. Just one quick question, Heather, sorry. Um, on the, are the regs any less enforceable than the policy, or why would something be put in reg versus policy? I know it's sort of implementation versus sort of the expectation, but I just wondered if it's mm -hmm. in reg, is it still, what's the standard which they have to be held to, accountable to it, I guess is what I'm asking. This might be a legal question. Yeah. yeah. All Thank employees you. are held responsible for knowing, enforcing, and understanding policies and regulations equally. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, keep going. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, regarding the policy, we'll go into particular categories here. So, the content of a student record. Uh, not very many people know that the student record is not just the cumulative record of the student and the cumulative record is uh, basic student information like personal information uh, as well as their assessment performance and transcript. That's what is an example is in the cumulative. But then also uh, what is a part of a student record is a disciplinary folder which includes the student suspension reports and disciplinary records. There's the health folder that's oftentimes at the school maintained in the health suite, but it, cons uh, it consists of information as part of the medical history of that student. Uh, then for uh, students with disabilities, they have their students with disability folder, which are the uh, components uh, in adherence to IDEA or the Individual with Disabilities Education Act. And then finally, there is an English learner folder, uh, and this cons consists of forms and documents related to the EL student. So again, uh, a very uh, comprehensive student record folder would include cumulative disciplinary health, students with disabilities, as well as EL. Do you want questions as you go through, or do you want us to? How, however you would like, yeah. Um, okay, I have two questions on this sure. slide, then, if we'll just stay so. Mm -hmm. under, under the section disciplinary, disciplinary records, it says, I get suspension reports, that's clear. What does disciplinary records mean? Say that question one more So time. it says disciplinary in the file, you'd have suspension reports, oh. that's clear. And, the discipline and then discipline records. records. What does that mean? So how would that be recorded if, if it's not a standard procedure? What does a discipline record look like? I will um, get back to you on that question just to make sure I'm not speaking out of turn and okay. we'll speak with our su suspension services department. I just want to make sure it's consistent mm -hmm. and that we're collecting the same information for every kid. It's not like we're compiling something on certain students and not others and it just it'd be clear to know what that means. Yes, definitely. Um, Martha's question on that same slide under health, she asks, uh, what if there is no health suite or school nurse? How many schools are there that may have inadequate student health support? This could impact participation in things like fish and dental programs as well as uh, BMI or other things that are tr people are trying to collect. So I guess you sort of, how is that carried through if you don't have a health suite and who keeps tr track of those records? And could that impact participation in other health areas? Okay. Question, Mr. Bondina. Yes, yeah, so I would also like to know: some uh, schools and some locations do not have a, a safe place to hold some of these records. And if you just mentioned something about not having a health suite, where I mean, it, you know, with human resources, they have to have a secure area to hold mm -hmm. confidential information. Um, what happens when they, it, you may have to mm -hmm. ask that question as well, mm -hmm. what happens when you don't have those, um, mm -hmm. those health suite or a secure area and mm -hmm. is it available for anyone to open up a, a mm -hmm. file and look at a student's records? Mm -hmm. the, the regulations state that all of the records must be maintained in a secure location, uh, not just in you know, not just in a s specific office, but in general. Uh, examples that we have given to schools is that there is a locked file cabinet in the main office that uh, where all of the records are, are maintained. Or if there is a IEP room, uh, that there are locked file cabinets and a locked door. Uh, for those records to be to be maintained. That would be the same location as an employee, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
I will suggest so to summarize, there's the question around the discipline record uh, and just getting clarification on that. I do believe it, it would be in alignment with our student uh, code of conduct, um, but we'll get clarity on that. And then the second is questions regarding the, um, the health, uh, the health suite and just uh, maintenance of health records in general in order for students to be able to access uh, opportunities such as vision tests, dental tests, things things like that. Sure. All right. In terms of our policy standards and compliance, so um, what we want to make sure that we are uh, in adherence to uh, first and foremost is federal laws, including FERPA and IDEA, any state law requirements, regulations from also our Maryland State Board of Education, as well as the Maryland Student Records System Manual. And so in developing the policy, as well as the recommendations, uh, as well as the compliance apologies, we wanted to make sure that we were in on, on those areas, as well as being able to capture anything else. Uh, student records uh, should, be re should be retained in accordance with what the district's board policy EHB is, uh, which is our retention schedule. No staff member or student shall furnish any list of student names without proper consent of that student or parent guardian. Uh, and then finally, that uh, city schools will conduct a records audit of a sample of our school uh, of a sample of schools and provide findings, uh, including recommendations by September one um, and in advance to our MSD biannual audit. The focus attention here is on our cumulative and special education folders because those are two uh, two folders that we have to pull from in anticipation of the MSD biennial audit. I will say also, um, I think this is in conducting an audit, this is also our opportunity as a way to ensure that all of the records are located in a secure location um, as an extra step of adhering to, to that component of our, of our records policy. So I will walk through uh, the components of the regulation. So just going in order here. So first, retention of the student record. So again, um, everything in accordance with our Maryland Student Records Manual, relevant federal law, and of course, board policy EHB. Um, the cumulative folder retention, we are required to retain the SR card one, SR card three, uh, the transcripts and graduation requirement waivers are all permanently retained. Um, this is in compliance again with our Maryland Student Records Manual. Uh, for the disciplinary folder, these are all retained until graduation of a high school program or the age 21, whichever comes later. Um, for the health folder, the medical assistance records are retained for six years. And then for the Students with Disabilities folder, um, documents like the IEP or the IFSP are retained for six years uh, after the student exits the district or until the age of 24. Um, and then all of the other documents, the assessment reports, the meeting summary sheets, the notes, the special service information system form are all retained for six years after the student exits the district. Um, so none of these are new or changes. These are all outlined in EHB, our retention policy already. I have a question. When you say retained, mm -hmm. and you, you, what you really mean is when the student no longer can be a, a student at, at, in the school system to, at the age of 21. We keep the records for 20, six more years. Okay. After six years, where does it go? There is a... Um, so. There's a piece on the destruction of records, which we'll get to, but there are yeah, records must be destroyed in a way to maintain anonymity in compliance with FERPA. Um, shredded is, is mostly what should happen. So after six years or after the age of 21, mm -hmm. we cannot, for legal reasons, for whatever legal reasons, get a copy of the students' records from K through 12 for legal reasons, for example, if something should occur 
the 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 uh, le uh, ju uh, judicial system <coughs> cannot mm -hmm. come in and get a copy. It's long gone. It's no. It no longer exists. So what what would be maintained uh, is in that first bullet, first sub bullet, the SRC card one, and in the appendix it gives the descriptions of what all of the letters mean, but. But this is the personal information, so this gives the personal information of that student, addresses, things like that, mm -hmm. birth date, uh, or date of birth. Um, SRC 3 is what the detailed student uh, high That's school awesome. transcript is, and then in addition to those two cards, it's the actual student transcript, which would give the uh, if the student graduated, it would give the graduation date for that student. So it's a way of us verifying that the student did meet the high school graduation requirements and did graduate from a Baltimore City Public School. So those are the three that we maintain permanent. Um, then there are all of the other components of the cumulative folder uh, that uh, would be retained until the student turns the age of 21, which we then after that discard. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm, I'm confused with that, which is okay, but <laughs> I'm just wondering right. if, if, if something should occur in the future, you right. have no opportunity, you don't have an opportunity to look at those records even if after that age of 21. Well, and you, you do. It you depends do which grades record. and there are yeah. certain so grades. I got, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm saying if it was incidents, disciplinary. Uh -huh. it's, okay, student records. Okay. Yes, we would have no need for those records. You know, six years after a student graduates, for purposes of law enforcement, mm -hmm. um, with all due respect, the Board of Education should not be the default for okay. investigations, mm -hmm. and in many instances, that information may not be. Um, relevant to okay. any sort mm -hmm. of criminal activity that occurs years especially later. Especially given the age of the child. Especially yeah. given the age of the child. Okay, mm -hmm. okay thank you. Mm -hmm. I do have a question though. So when you talk about the six years of, of deleting records or keeping them in filled six years, how does that process happen? By who, who makes sure that those records are deleted? Is, do they go into a, is it an electronic file? What does that look like? Sure. So this is where this policy really is a collaboration between multiple offices. So speak, as the Office of Student Records that led this effort, I can really speak primarily to the cumulative folder because that's something that we retain. Um, within our office, we have uh, the, the physical records for closed schools. Um, otherwise, the records are maintained at the high school that the student graduated from, um, from the year 2000 on. So they have those records there. The guidance we give to school staff has been consistent with this since this part, this part is not new to this policy and is part of EHB already. So the guidance has been consistent on these are the pieces to retain permanently and how to properly dis dispose of other components of the record. Um, so, we're relying, so we're relying relying on the high schools. School staff. To take yes, care of this. that is correct. Um, you know, then speaking to other so the IEP piece, for example, so that would be our special education office that manages that. So it's multiple. It seems like a lot of moving parts and a lot of opportunity to fail on this one. Right, and, yeah. and what I would add to that, so your question about how is it organized and maintained, as Ben was mentioning, the Office of Student Records uh, maintains the records uh, for our schools of graduates pre-2000. Um, mm -hmm. as well as those records of closing schools. From a management perspective on our end, we have been able to identify and organize all of our records to, you know, the, you know, year, if you will, year of termination. So mm -hmm. when components of a cumulative folder could be terminated or could be uh, destroyed. Uh, we have engaged in some strategic conversations at the district office level around how do we move towards a digitization of our permanent records and then all of the other records from a cumulative folder that can be uh, that can be shredded or discarded that we do that in a strategic manner. Two years ago, I can also add, or at least two years ago, uh, when uh, the Office of Specialized Services, as they were also um, maintaining some IEP records, 
in order for IEP records to be destroyed, there are additional steps that have to be taken in which uh, families of students with disabilities must be notified in advance if any record is to be destroyed so that they could come and pick up. So we did a notification two or over two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it was our first time notifying uh, through the paper of our intent to destroy records from, I can't speak offhand, but from a certain year back um, and that if anyone wanted to come in and with enough proof of, you know, proof, uh, take a copy of that record prior to it being destroyed. And it's my knowledge that the special ed office has done the same last year and will continue to implement a process such as that so that, again, we are as a district responsible for the records that we say we are responsible for as part of our policies and we are continuing to adhere to the regulations set forth through Maryland Student Records Manual um, as well as um, uh, the, the Maryland state policies. So just to clarify, mm -hmm. our current perm permanent cumulative records are not digitized as of yet? Correct. Correct. And how long is it going to take us to so get there? As a, as a point of clarity for, to better. that, um, a student's, since we moved to an uh, online student information system, our student transcripts are online, right? Okay. So that is already okay. in digital form. Um, what we're referencing more are those records from 19, I will say 19, prior to 1990 and back. Mm -hmm where um, most of that documentation was just paper and pencil. Um, the district uh, several years ago began digitizing some of those, some of those records. Uh, we have a number of records on microfilm, uh, over 180 rolls of microfilm. Uh, and then we have, you know, filing cabinets of just paper, of paper records. We've put forward a uh, proposal to the CEO, which we're planning to implement this year, to begin digitizing records. Uh, the first priority for our digitization is that we digitize those permanent components of a record, of a cumulative record, uh, that is in the main possession of the Office of Student Records. So again, those are those records pre-2000 mm -hmm. that would be digitized. Um, and then, uh, and that would take about a three-year process to do all of that. Uh, and then we would move forward with thinking about and submitting a proposal uh, to the CEO around how do we begin digitizing the records from 2000 onward that are currently maintained within our schools. But as we move forward, is there a point in time where we can start digitizing information in the real time? So we're not having to go backwards mm -hmm. and continue to, so yep. when does we, that happen? Yeah. We can look at that. I think one consideration is want, not wanting to digitize something that wouldn't be kept permanently. That's right, yeah. So we'd have to then build out a schedule, I think, after we've accomplished the digitization of everything at the high schools that is already able to be digitized, then developing the schedule that says, okay, which should we wait till 21 and then only digitize the pieces that are permanent? or do we digitize in real time as we go? So that's something that has to be considered with the schools and a little more, yeah, a little more thought. I won't belabor this, this is the last question. I'm sorry, I'm taking so much time on the slide. That's but, okay. Um, so the, the information goes from your office to the high schools, letting them know what they're supposed to keep and what they're not supposed to keep. So in this six year cycle, mm -hmm. you would communicate then with the high school, whoever's point person for that, to the, who maintains those records mm -hmm. to that's take right. care of that. And that's the, that's basically the compliance we have besides the audits that you're talking about doing by September right. 1 annually. Right. Yes. It's, it's guidance and then random audits. Mm -hmm. yes. We conduct multiple Training. trainings throughout the course of every school year. Okay. Reinforcing to uh, our registrars at our schools as well as to our principals around what are the records that they are required to maintain for those inactive students, as well as what are the records that they should be keeping up to date for active students or students that are still in there on their role. Okay. Yeah, not only and, I, and I ask, just because simply we're putting in policy, we're putting in 
print that we're going to have this policy. We're going to delete these after every six years, and then mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we can actually do what we say we're trying to do with this policy. Yeah. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I went on you. Oh, right. Okay. There's definitely a lot of moving yeah. parts to and thank move. You for yes. patience. No just, problem. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of moving parts to move to a more digital world, um, and those are conversations that we are having with our IT department too, and thinking about how do we even how do we even move into that world, right? What does the storage capacity look like? How do we ensure security in our cloud-based uh, systems? And then what is the cost associated to that? And 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 what are those budget proposals that need to be considered um, by cabinet in thinking about priorities in general for, for the school district? Mm -hmm. Okay. Slide 10, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Only right. 20 to go. <laughs> Luckily, we've we have, covered we a few already. Hour, so, yeah, yeah we're good. Anything. Get comfortable. We're good. <laughs> so student records maintenance. Um, again, this is just highlighting that our guidance is in line with state requirements and federal law, um, that it is the responsibility of the city schools departments that work with the appropriate records to provide that guidance and training. So again, you know, student records works primarily with the cumulative file. That's the training and guidance we provide. Um, you know, it would have to come from the discipline office to provide guidance on the discipline record. And then we also, there are <coughs> times at which schools then should be responsible for reviewing their student records. Um, those times at a minimum are basically times of transition um, when students are matriculating from one school to the next, when a student is graduating, uh, transfer, and then also at the time that there's the annual IEP review, that record should be reviewed. There's also a requirement for the EL folder to be reviewed annually as well. Okay. Transferring student records. So this is, again, guidance that we have been providing in an ongoing manner to our schools. But essentially, at the time of transfer, um, it can begin with a parent. So a parent can request a transfer packet to the sending school. Um, in the regulation, you can see the full components of the transfer packet. But essentially, it's copies, not original records. Uh, the receiving school then has to submit a formal request to the sending school. Only after receiving that formal request does the sending school actually send the complete physical records. Um, and the sending school is then also required to maintain copies for four years. So I would just add to that the, the two main points there I would, uh, or three points I would focus on are in terms of the sending of copies, the sending of those copies within five days. So that's a big thing that we push during our trainings with our registrars there. Once you receive the notification uh, that a student is transferring from your school, please prioritize the actual sending of that, the copies of that okay. record because that's really if a student is moving out of state or to another LEA or even within the school district, oftentimes that's like that's their history of, of their experience here at Baltimore City Public Schools. So we do want to make sure that that, that uh, receiving school gets that as quickly as possible to then inform the academic planning for that student. And then the other key point is that then the sending school maintains a copy of that record for four years. Uh, and part of that rationale is because of our biennial audit with MSDE. Uh, if, you know, we're being audited right now for school year 15-16, if a student transferred in 16-17 uh, from one school A to school B, the, the school, um, this, if a student's record is being requested for 15-16, then we have to go back to school A. To, to see those copies. So, so that, those are just a couple of things that we wanted to uh, emphasize in the records uh, policy as well as in the regulations around those key uh, time stamps. I must imagine the communication to schools has to be so tight on this. If you have a four-year window, you're keeping now copies additional to the cumulatives, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. lot of papers. A lot of papers. It's a lot of yeah. paper. And a lot of guidance, I would assume, and mm -hmm. reminders about Cleanup well, and yes. maintenance and mm -hmm. training guidance reminders. Yes, so we have. So it is the official list of registrars that are identified by principals as part of the school readiness project, and that's who gets. Yeah, pretty okay. much. Um, 
almost monthly, I would say, reminders. And we don't put records in the hands of parents. We do it school to school transfer directly. Parents can receive the transfer packet, which is copies only of some of the records, and that's detailed in the regulation. But essentially, if a parent had that, they could have a copy of the IEP, for example, which would mean that s the service could be hopefully more seamless than even waiting the five days mm -hmm. from another mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, disposal of student records. So this came up a little bit when we were talking about the retention, but uh, this is guided, um, again, by the EHB uh, document, uh, which is in accordance with FERPA. So the key thing is that any legally confidential information must be, you know, protected in the destruction of the file. So when we're talking about paper files, Generally, shredding is the preferred method n to know that you know this information is protected. Um, if it's a disk or a CD, like there are other disposal um, methods outlined in EHB. Um, the other piece, just to remember, and we noted here, is that if there is a current litigation hold, so or a subpoena or if it was just an MPIA, then the document would not, would not be destroyed on the normal schedule and could be retained until the conclusion of that, of that, that request. Um, this is the other point about IDEA, which Heather brought up earlier, um, just that the, there is a requirement to inform parents prior to destruction of those records, um, and that applies just to those records for uh, students with special needs that is um, under IDEA. Okay, digitization. So we've talked a little bit about how we are trying to move that way, um, including here just the guidance from the Maryland Student Records Manual that needs to be complied with as we move to digitizing any student records. Um, it's really pretty scant guidance. Um, we just need to include all elements that are in those student record cards already. Um, you need to make sure that any images of, of all documents are included in a digital record. And then there need to be signatures um, that, are scan either that are scanned in if there are any kind of changes being made to a record. Um, so the current proposal we have certainly meets all those requirements. Um, we're really looking at digitizing the physical student record itself so everything is maintained. Okay, so legal requests for student records uh, come through the Office of Student Record uh, if they are subpoenas or court-ordered records requests. So the process that our Office of Student Records currently uses and which is laid out here in the regulation, um, any documentation, any student records that we have in our possession, so students who graduated the prior to 2000 or the closed schools are responded to directly by our student record staff. Otherwise, these are referred back to the school that would currently have the record. Um, in some cases, if it's a something like a special education record, we then will work with the appropriate office that would maintain those records. Um, once the subpoena or the legal request has been transferred to another office or to a school, they are then have the responsibility of complying with that request um, in the time frame that has been uh, requested. Um, if those dates lapse, the requirement is then just to contact the requester directly, so the law office or whoever it may be, to explain um, why, it's, why we've missed the deadline and develop a new deadline or other alternative methods. Okay, amendment of a student record. So this is um, in accordance with KEARA, uh, one of our policies already, but essentially if there is any information that is inaccurate or misleading or in a violation of the student's rights to privacy, um, a parent, a guardian, or the eligible student can request an amendment. Um, the amendment, can, this can then lead to a hearing uh, to decide if that information was in fact uh, somehow incorrect and then the it would be then on the city school's responsibility to amend the student records accordingly and inform the requester in writing. Okay, 
the online transcript request process. So this is a process managed by our Office of Student Records. Um, so it is, this is something that is a fairly recent change. It began August of 2016, moved to an online request system, replacing a paper form uh, request system. So this requests are made through this system. Um, again, students that are within the Office of Student Records that we have access to those records either uh, digitally or in um, microfilm or in our paper records. We respond to those. Um, otherwise, they can be referred back to the school that would still have those records. Um, there is a currently a charge, uh, a fee, for providing the transcript, which is in accordance with our process. Um, and that, if that fee has been $5 for former students for many years at this point, but if there was a change, we would have to make sure there was notification of that change to the fee structure. So, question question Hassan had questions on this slide. Sure, sure. I think we've answered them, but let me just read them out loud. I said I would do that. Mm -hmm. Fine. Um, first of all, she, she states, is this not overly burdensome on schools? I don't think she was understanding what we just learned about where the records are kept and how they're held. So, mm -hmm. the yes. next question alludes to that. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't a central repository of cumulative folders managed by the district better support consistency for students who are transient as well as support consistent policy implementation related to storage, retrieval, and timely appropriate destruction where appropriate? Wouldn't a central system also help track enrollment, trends, counts, et cetera? So, I think what she's alluding to is that we probably should think, or she wants us to think through having a central repository versus a school-based system for keeping of the records. I don't know right. that that's even possible given right. the amount of paper we're talking about here. It, it's I mean, not she didn't physically the possible in until, paper, yeah. but part of moving to digitization could address some of those challenges. That's right. right. And what, just to, again, make sure we're all clear and understanding, we're, we're really thinking strategically about how do we move to a central repository mm -hmm. for inactive records but that an active student record is still the responsibility of the school where the child is attending right. to maintain because that is something that does have to be amended Regularly. on a on a regular mm -hmm. basis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tisha, if we can make sure though that she understands that the question was read and that there really is a maybe we would get a quick write up for her if you don't mind sure. no on the, where we have a central repository versus um, what where we have it at school records mm -hmm. and then the, the live. A quick paragraph. We don't need a, a, a okay. document that is five pages long. Okay. I just want to get her question answered so that she doesn't come yeah. back and circle back and ask again at the public session. Um, a quick email to Tanisha would take care of that. Okay. Okay. We can do that. I'm going to forward this to you now. Okay. Okay. Any other uh, questions from the two of you? Well, there are there. Okay. okay. So moving along then. Um, so the annual notification of rights under FERPA, um, this is currently happening in the Baltimore City Public Schools Family Handbook, which is sent home at the beginning of each school year. But this is just you know, making sure that families and guardians are aware of the rights with respect to the student's education records. Um, so this is, again, something ongoing that we just wanted to include in this comprehensive policy regulation. And then uh, also in accordance with uh, FERPA, as well as our board policies, um, we're just highlighting the directory information and access to student records. So, components of the student record that are designated as directory information um, can be disclosed without written consent. This is generally names and maybe enrollment histories, basic things like that. Um, this is the definition of what is designated as directory information shifts. Um, so we'll just have to stay in compliance with mm -hmm. that. All right, so in terms of our timeline of how we uh, built this policy and regulation, so over this past summer, our office uh, led collaborative work with all the other offices and departments that work with the different components of the student record. Um, We've also begun doing uh, collecting stakeholder feedback. So we met with PCAB a few weeks back. Um, in the next version of these slides, we'll include their feedback. We were waiting for some additional feedback from one of their uh, private meeting, closed meetings. So that will be then added. Um, we're now here addressing the policy committee, and then we have first reader and second reader scheduled in the early 2018. And that is all. So other remaining questions? Commissioner Thank you. 
The takeaway for me is listening to what you're doing, you have a process going on. But my other concern is you still have schools that have paper records. The greatest concern that could happen at any point is a fire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of those records could, could be completely destroyed. And, yeah. and so I'm not encouraging or <laughs> thinking about it, but that, that's, that could really happen at any point. I think what? that's a very valid concern. I mean, that's why. Because the, you, it seems that the system is really, really, really behind. And, it is. Uh, and I would say, I would ask the question, has it occurred already? I'm not aware of that occurring at any schools. Um, I mean. Not most recently. Not recently, at least. Decades ago, right. there were some schools that either had a flood mm -hmm. or had a fire. I mean, our, our current active students, mm -hmm. much of this information is captured somewhere mm -hmm. online already. So we had our student right. information system, in our mm -hmm. Maryland online system. Mm -hmm. So much of our, for most of our current students, there's, there would be less risk of loss, but this is why the next phase of our digitization plan would be to then try to get all those inactive records that are still stored at schools right. and making sure those are digitized. Well, you said it would take about three years. We're looking, at th we're looking at about three years right now for okay. the inactive records that are currently here mm -hmm. in our student records Up office. Yes, so we would then, mm -hmm. so that would be the first phase and then ideally the next phase, okay. which you know would still need cabinet support mm -hmm. and a budget amendment and yeah, all that okay. components, but would be mm -hmm. the, getting the inactive records from the schools. Okay, thank you. Thank you for indulging you. our, our 10,000 questions, or my no, 10,000 yes. questions. No problem. Thank You're you. welcome. Okay. Um, so that concludes our public content. Um, we don't have all of our speakers here, so I'm going to go through. We ha we're supposed to start public comment at 5 and go till 5.30. We do have folks that have signed up for public comment. If they are here, we'll go ahead and take public comment now. But I also believe we need to wait until 5 o'clock to make sure that folks are able to make it because we said we would be here. Um, so the first person we have is Pat Cullen. Is Pat Cullen here? Fantastic. Oh, I, now that on my agenda. Can we, can, we, can we hold you just for one moment, sir? Okay. Do you want me to take care of that now? should be on the agenda. Okay, that's fine. So if you, if you allow me just one indulgence before you speak, sir. I apologize. We had to um, take care of one bit of business. You can stay right where you are. No need to move. We were supposed to um, vote for the new chair for the policy committee. Um, and so um, I will take a nomination from the floor for the chair of the policy committee. Okay. I nominate Martha. Yes. Okay, yes. Martha James Hassan has been nominated as chair. Do I have a second for that second. nomination. Second for the nomination. All those in favor of Martha Sa James Hassan becoming chair, please say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. aye. All those nay. Motion passes three to zero. Mm -hmm. Martha's not here. Obviously, she couldn't vote for herself. Mm -hmm. um, but yay, Martha. Martha's the new policy chair once again. Okay. Good for her. Okay. She'll be very pleased to hear that. Um, I'm sorry. I apologize for that delay. Um, so we have three minutes, and you can start whenever you are ready. Microphone. Is it on, sir? I don't think it's yeah, on. Push the, push the button right in front. Uh, screen. There you go. And I've been trying ever since. Uh, we've gone through $160,000 putting on a, over 100 workshops on parental engagement. We've run out of money. It wasn't my fault because I don't get paid over that five and a half year period. I'm here today because I believe that it is your mission to review uh, your regulations. And I think it's also a priority of the school board to have parent engagement uh, be a subject of concern and that the, there be more deeply engaged parents in their kids' education. So that's why I'm here today. I'm a little frustrated with it, and my request to you is simply this. I'm asking you to appoint a committee, a subcommittee of yours, or an independent committee, or BERC, B-E-R, 
C, to review your own regulations with reference to, that's uh, KCA, con concerning parental engagement. And the reason is because I have done everything I could think to do to move somebody upstairs and I can't get anybody to do anything that resembles effective increasement of parental engagement. There's no definition of parental engagement here at all. I think your regulation requires annual reports on who's doing what to whom. No smart goals are ever used in these plans and, and it's difficult to tell if anybody did anything or if there is anybody in this entire district who is engaged. So I, w I come to you because I think that your regulation can be tightened up, amended, remodeled to be more effective in terms of getting the people who are on the administrative side to understand exactly what you want them to do. That, that's why I'm here today. I have, uh, I've done a research project. I did a protocol for evaluating effectiveness of parental engagement. In November, I submitted that to the powers that be. The response was none. No rejection, no comment, no request, no thanks, nothing. So I don't know what else to do. I'm coming to you and asking you to, to do that. Um, so that's it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you have a lap. I want to make sure you want, you don't have anything else to get through. I'm going like, to use the last 30 seconds. You good? Okay. So I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you're suggesting that we um, appoint a committee to work with Burke? Did I? No. No. You appoint a committee of your own designation or you ask me, Mr. Cohen, could you put together a committee and bring it to us for approval as to who's on the committee? and what the proposed issues are, I could do that. Okay. Or you could refer the whole business to Burke. Okay. okay. But, but it, it focuses, this is a priority. Okay, I just wanted to clarify, your, thank you. Is that thank clear? You. Yes, got it, thank have you. Have you met with PCAB? Oh, have I met with PCAB? Huh, do birds fly? <laughs> I went to a year and a half worth of their meetings. This is the research project that I did on the effectiveness of PCAB as pertains to family engagement. I found out that due to the way their statute is written, they do not accept responsibility for parental engagement increases or decreases. They are there to be a telephone answering service and they listen to uh, presentations much as you had here today. They listen to those that cost this district $50,000 a year to have that group sit and wait for somebody to call and ask them about policy issues and to, to state on behalf of the parents um, what their position is with reference to proposed, but that, that's what they do. So have I been to PCAB? That was the first place I went. And here's, here's my, I read their minutes for three years. I read the school board's minutes for three years. But here's, here's what I handed in as my research project. I tried to follow another research project to follow up doing research in the schools on the protocol that I developed. The achievement and accountability people refused to let me do it on the pretense that the school, the district's already doing it. They don't even have a protocol. So there was no, I mean, that was just so much who struck John that they didn't want me to do that. So, I, so here I am. So, um, Chief Legal Counsel. Um, currently, Sabrina um, uh, Sutton, thank you, is our engagement specialist, is that correct? Can we make sure that the communication gets to Sabrina about what he's asking for and at least get a report back to the board on the policy compliance around reporting on uh, parent engagement? I'm not sure that, I, I can't recall when we've had our last presentation or conversation about that. I want to notice where we are in the timeline of reporting and what's expected to come down the pike, and then if, she, if we can get his concerns directly to Sabrina, and maybe she can address what the district is planning currently on parent engagement activities. I'm not sure. We haven't spoken with her in quite some time, so it would be helpful to have the board as well as our, our speaker here to have an update on what is happening with parent engagement. I, I have to tell you, I went to them, to Ms. Sutton and her 
PhD who's in charge of priority schools for family engagement. I had a conference with them. And I came to them and I said, look, I want to help. Is there any way that I can help either you at the district level or with these 21 priority schools? And neither one of them could think of anything that I possibly could do with a, a law degree, working in the city for 50 years, parents of school teachers, five and a half years working on parental engagement with research binders from here to there, they couldn't think of a single thing that I could do to help. Sure. Trish, do you want to say something? Yeah. And we're not, this is not a debate. This is you can give a, a statement from PCAB. I just, since, P, since PCAB is this the is, board's arm for parental engagement, I'll go ahead and give a statement. I just want to say that Mr. Cullen's report is from before I was the chair, before PCAB came to every board meeting, before this past year. This report does not include anything that's happened 2016 to now. That's really all I wanted okay. to say. Thank you. So the information that he just gave about PCAB is currently, is not current and is not what's happening now. Thank you. Thank you. I know it's unusual for this, so I appreciate it. That's okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have Kimberly Mooney. I think I saw her walk in. We were going. Do you can, do you want to come with students? Do you want to come by yourself and have your student call up individually? How would you like to proceed? I'll come and sit behind them, but I think that they were prepared to say. Okay. So, students, if you can introduce yourselves, please come, on, come forward. Come on, and have a seat at the table. Um, sure. Why not? Three, three minutes each, absolutely. Okay. Um, and please introduce yourselves before you speak. And each of you take your own three minutes so you make sure you have your time. Um, if we have individual questions, we can either do them with each person or we can do it as a group at the end. It's whatever you prefer. And so, uh, Ms. Mooney, you do not want to speak, is that correct? I, ha I mean, you're, you're listed, so. Fair enough. I'll hold the three minutes in case you need it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I am Lucas Imhoff. I'm from Roland Park Middle Elementary School. Um, I'm pause you for one second. Put the microphone a little closer to your mouth and just speak up a little. We're having, we're having a little bit of auditory problem here. We can't hear very well. Mm -hmm. So just speak right into the microphone a little okay. bit louder, please. Hello, my name is Lucas Imhoff. Go. I'm from Roland Park Middle Elementary School. Today I'd like to talk to you about my experience with being a gender queer and student and why we need uh, a specific transgender and gender nonconforming students protection bill. Um, for the most part, when I came out in seventh grade, everybody was supportive, but there were a few commentators who made some comments. <laughs> I, brushed off, I brushed it off at first, but over the year it became harder to fight the thoughts in my head. You know, Lucas, maybe you really are a faggot. I remember one time it had me it even had me in tears another time more recently i was coming out of the school's gender neutral bathroom and a person saw me walk out of the bathroom and asked why were you in there i said well because i have the right to be there he then says why because you have a special vagina or something i did not engage him further but i had a lousy day from then on there this is not okay not only do we need a sexual harassment policy, but we also need a trans and gender nonconforming protection bill. And something I'd like to point out with your pr pr proposed plan, sorry, um, about the faxing form that you would have students uh, fill out and then fax to you guys about the um, sexual harassment uh, report, um, I would just, when I first heard about that, I was, my first reaction was, what's a fax machine? <laughs> um, I like, it's not, it's not something that like kids have uh, access to and then it creates problems further because most kids don't have a faxing machine at home. So they would have to talk to a parent or a teacher at the school to help them print or fax the thing over to you guys. Um, and 
I like from personal experience, if I was sexually harassed, I would not be comfortable going to somebody at the school and saying, I was sexually harassed, I filled out one of these, I need to fax it to North Avenue. So I think if you could um, maybe fix the way that we sent it to you guys, maybe by like email somewhere that was more private and more confidential. Um, another thing is I have some concerns on how students would know about this form because this has not been like brought to our attention. Um, so I think that you guys need to uh, think about ways that you could uh, make uh, teachers introduce the form to their students if you decide to use it. Um, and for going back to the um, transgender and gender nonconforming bill, we have some resources for you that I can give to you uh, after the thing for um, to maybe help you. There's like a Maryland proposed plan that you can just say, hey, this is the bill where the, where the policy that we're going to adopt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, So um, I do thank you for your testimony, and mm -hmm. I, I apologize myself for the harassment that you have endured. It is not fair, and we do not tolerate it, and I am sorry that that happened to you. Thank you. Um, and I do appreciate your bravery to come here before us today and talk about it openly. Um, I will say um, I agree with you on your facts question. That sounds um, something we could do something very easily to fix, like there could be an electronic form or something. I don't know what we can do legally to... Right. So my, 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 first, my first question, though, is you, you mm -hmm. stated, though, that you weren't comfortable going to your school, which I would think the first step in addressing harassment issue would be at your school, if it's happening at your school, and then if there's not resolution or there isn't a being addressed, that it would come to us. We wouldn't be the first stop to handle that situation. So well, help me understand what you mean by uh, that. Here's the problem with that. If uh, this is a very theoretical question, I have, there's, I have no doubt in my heart that this is not like this isn't going on at our school um, but if I was let's say sexually harassed by a teacher because this is not just about student on student this has to also be about student on teacher mm -hmm. because if there's no policy about that it leaves us vulnerable and open I would not be then comfortable going to the school and telling them that hey so and so did something to me and I'm not comfortable with that. Like, I would not be comfortable with, because teachers, like, at our school, they have a bond. So I would not be comfortable, like, going to our French teacher and saying, oh, our technology teacher, like, did something to it. Not that Mr. Hoffman would do that, because he's really nice. But, <laughs> um, we don't even know, don't, no names. We don't even know who they are. Right. But, and um, then, like, I feel like it doesn't even go on at school, because it's not, I wouldn't address it immediately. I would go home first because that is a traumatic experience. And I don't think that we should have to, like, file it at the school. I think we sh this could be something also that we could do with our parents and, like, have our parents report it because I would be way more comfortable, like, dealing with this with my parents than, like, dealing it with it with a teacher. Okay. I'm sorry. So um, the policy will be clarified so that it is clearly understood that certainly complaints can be made directly to the office of EEO. Certainly we would not expect anybody who is the alleged victim of harassment or discrimination to go to that person or person with whom the accused may have a relationship to make mm -hmm. such a report. And so not only in the student harassment policy, but it's also set forth in that very way with regard to adults that work for the school system. So it sounds like the language needs to be um, revisited just so that's clear. Mm -hmm. The Office of EEO is also in the process of working with um, our technology office to get an EEO mailbox. And one of the reasons we elected to go with the EEO mailbox rather than a mailbox to Mr. Parker is, you know, folks move on and about within the school system. And so we want to make sure that the address that sets forth in the policy and the regulation remains unchanged, irrespective of who's in the position. Can you clarify, when you say address, you mean an email? Email, email address. address, correct. So that we, that we can take away this fact. Correct. Question. So it may be EEO at BCPS, Thank that you. sort of thing. Thank you. Um, I believe the policy also sets forth that there will be a summary provided to principals and other administrators at the school that can be shared during homeroom. Um, there will also be information in the student handbook, and as everybody is aware, all parents and students receive a copy every year. 
our teachers, principals, guidance counselors, and other school-based staff receive annual training. And so there is a way to equip individuals to know how to deal with these sort of reports should a student feel comfortable making the initial claim to them. They know that they are then to contact either the EEO office or their principal depending on the circumstances. We've also can include if we have not done so external resources which will accept complaints of discrimination that are filed by students. And so we'll look at the policy again to make sure all of that information is set forth in a way that students and adults, parents can clearly understand, but certainly it is the intent of the policy and regulations that those are the protocols that would be followed. So just from my clarification okay. and understanding, I understand completely if it was a, a superior, a teacher, an adult in a mm -hmm. building, or that makes complete sense to me. Mm -hmm. When you have a student situation with another student, that complaint prefer preferably would to go to the EEO email. No, that well. would remain that would at go. the school. That's what I asked. But that is investigated That's under the direction of the EEO office. Okay. Yeah. So the guidance would be for students, if it's a student to student situation, mm -hmm. to reach out to the school directly, the school leadership, as in the principal. Yes, ma'am. And that principal would be guided by the EEO office Correct. as how to handle that situation. Correct. Okay. I have a question. Please. Back to the fax machine. <laughs> you were told to use it, to send your information through the fax. That's what you said? Yeah, we were told that the way we send the uh, forms in was by fax. Okay. So how soon will we be able to change that? It's, yeah, as soon as we get an address from um, the technology department. Okay, that can be done right away. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and you're welcome to stay. Who's that? Hi. Hi, I'm Logan Lloyd from Roland Park Middle School, and well, the issue isn't just the sexual assault and harassment portion. It's the fact that you're including a transgender policy within it. And while we're going to need a separate policy, because you can't include every policy or right for transgender students under a sexual harassment policy, because as someone who would like to play sports at my school but doesn't because they don't like the locker room situation it's an issue that you don't have like an actual policy set in place well and we have a gender neutral bathroom at our school but the locker rooms it's still very binary and you we don't have a way to make sure everyone feels included with that and if you would like to play a, play a sport or be in physical education you do have to stick with your assigned sex and that's going to make me and many other people feel uncomfortable and we do have the Maryland Department Education guideline for transgender and, and not gender nonconforming guideline and it's really good and it does cover everything we would like to be covered and you guys could basically just kind of use that one and just implement that and it would have everything we wanted in a policy but you c including your entire transgender policy under sexual harassment is an issue and because it's not always going to be harassment based it might just be not knowing our rights or not knowing what can and cannot be allowed and we can't so we can't just assume everyone's going to be knowledgeable on these topics so having the teachers or other staff members knowledgeable on the on the rules would help because then the students would know them as well Um, do we have a copy of, this, of the guidelines? I have not seen them. The MSDE guidelines? Yes, we have them. them. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, they have them, too. I have, have them. them. Um, can, we, can we share what we talked about at the public session um, as far as the... So the, the last time mm -hmm. there was testimony given on this, we had a public session uh, evening meeting. 
and there was a recommendation from someone who gave testimony about um, complying with the law, mm -hmm. the policy. Mm -hmm. It was created in Frederick, Maryland. And, mm -hmm. and our chief legal counsel shared with us that there is currently um, litigation. Correct. Um, if you can clarify that for us. Because the recommendation right now is to think about what are the short-term solutions we can put into the, this policy that's currently before us until the litigation is resolved Correct. in another county so that we understand from the court's perspective what we can and cannot do. Um, I understand we have the guidelines, mm -hmm. but if you can just share that a little, share, share the thinking behind that a little bit, I would really appreciate that. Yeah, so I, I think it was well stated by you, but just to, re <laughs> just to reiterate, um, Mr. Parker, who serves as the EEO manager, um, is working with PCAB to get back on their agenda. And the plan is to some extent um, address the rights um, of transgender individuals with regard to bathrooms, name changes, and a few other topics. There are other topics that are areas that are not clearly defined by the law as of yet. And we are aware of litigation against two Maryland school systems, and so the um, advice given during the last meeting is based on the posture of those cases and to protect this board. Um, as well as ensure the rights of transgender students and adults that may be in our facilities, that we take a more conservative approach, at least temporarily. And that would include addressing those three topics in either the proposed policy and regulations that will be coming back before you probably in early November, and then working um, with school-based staff to address other needs as they arise. What I can say is while certain areas may not be reduced to policy, it is not at all um, a sign that the board does not respect um, and honor the rights of transgender individuals, nor that school-based staff will not be advised of what actions are appropriate and what actions are not acceptable. Um, what our mission and goal is and how we treat all individuals is what drives the day-to-day -day work at schools. And so education can continue irrespective of what the board adopts in policy. Um, training is continuing even while this policy is in the um, implement in the um, phase. Yeah, phase. Yeah. And so again, we'll keep everything under advisement and as the law develops, we'll continue to update the policy. But I'll just say one last time that it is not in any way an indication that folks don't understand some of the challenges that are faced and that the school system is not making all efforts to address them in a fair way. And if the board does decide to move forward with um, adding pieces of the mm -hmm. concerns to this policy, it does not preclude us from in the future, a few months from now when litigation is resolved, mm -hmm. coming back to the table and considering a full policy if we so desired. A fuller policy. A fuller po well, or yes. a separate policy is what I'm saying. Or a separate or policy. That's what I meant. We could sort of, it doesn't preclude us from being able to do that. Okay. You pointed out one thing though that I think I, I have not heard yet, which is that the this is a more about harassment versus a rights-based policy and I appreciate you pointing that out. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, we'll definitely take that into consideration because I, I hear you loud and clear this is not just about protections for harass, against harassment, it's also protections of basic rights. So I, I appreciate that. Um, anything else for you? Yeah. Okay. And if I can just add for members of the public that may be listening, while the fax number is listed on the complaint form, there's also a phone number that is correct. And so there is still a way for individuals to get in touch with the Office of EEO without sending a fax and pending adoption of the policy by the board. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I'm going one by one. Oh, so, okay. Good. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Raquel McGee. I'm from Roland Park. Sorry. My name is Raquel McGee, and I'm from Roland Park. And I want to address the fact that I had health for, I mean, I had health two years ago, and we were talking about, like, how to have safe sex with just straight people. So, like, um, a couple of other students and myself wanted to know, like, how to, like, have sex like if you're not straight or if you're transgender like how would you do that they didn't explain that they just explain like how to have sex if you're straight so 
Yeah, that was it. So it's a curriculum issue. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're pointing out a curriculum issue that we have. Yes. And asking us to think about how we can address that. Can you make sure that our teaching and learning folks get that testimony and maybe even come back to the board with a response as to what the curriculum is advised to teach and how we can think about modifying that? Can I, uh, sure. Can I add something? Um, another thing that we were. Is this on? Okay. Another thing we were talking about was. Um, the, at our school, there have been pregnancies in eighth grade and seventh and sixth. Um, and Baltimore has one of the highest HIV rates, um, which is not just spread throughout the gay community, but is majorly spread through the gay community. And I think one of the things that we should do is uh, just do a complete curriculum revise and add in things or like just have open spaces to like answer any questions but make sure that the teachers are briefed on how to answer questions to LGBT students. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Was it, was it no, I, I just saying to myself, I need to say to you how I am so impressed with you coming forward and speaking and giving us really good advice and put it in on the table. And I recommend all of the things that you're talking about. As a matter of fact, I think at some point we should have something like a forum where we could all come together and have this discussion openly. You know, for I the think teachers that school. will help. Huh? Def I think that will definitely help. And the teachers, the students, and number one, the parents. Mm -hmm. Because many of the issues that we're talking about starts at home. You know, yeah. and then we can move it to the school. But I would be very happy to encourage the board and also the students to um, have a session or form where we can have it in parts or you know, one major one, whichever, whatever will work would be great. But thank you so much. But we'll uh, you. just one thing about the forum that I want to remind you is that not everybody is out to their parents. I I'm clear on that. Okay, cool. Yes. Just make it sure. Thank you. Which is why we would appreciate your being able to come talk to us today in a public forum. We really appreciate it. And it did not fall on deaf ears. Trust us, it did not. Would you uh, like the model policy that Glisten did uh, for the transgender rights? Uh, we, ha we have it. Oh, you do? Oh, is that? That's the Maryland, that's the Maryland one. We have another yeah, one. Please. We love that as well. Ms. Mooney, would you like to give testimony as well? Um, yes. But you all did awesome, so there's very little for me to say. So if you want to come back here. Mm -hmm. She's testified before also. How are you going to sit with me? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Please introduce yourself. Yes. We have three minutes. I'm Kimberly Mooney. I'm the GSA advisor for Roland Park Elementary Middle School. I'm Stephanie Saffron. I'm, a, I'm Stephanie Saffron. I'm the GSA mom for Roland Park Elementary <laughs> Middle School and also Eli's mom. Hi, Eli. And I think most of you nice wanted to. Nice to see you again. I spoke to you once. I would yeah. remember. <laughs> it was powerful so, testimony. Okay. So Eli and I decided to come back because um, she did speak to the board last February, and since then we have put in the hands of either district staff people or board members Look closer. Yeah, many Sorry. copies, uh, multiple copies of multiple versions of draft gender equity policies, and these would spell out um, along sort of various domains ways that principals and teachers and staff in schools can respond to and support and affirm the rights of LGBTQ kids. And we feel like that's really, really vital to have in place. You know, you, you can't talk about discrimination if people genuinely don't know that their behavior is wrong. And in this case, I think we have a lot of education to do. Um, it seems that the district is not willing to act yet. And Ms. Mooney filled me in that there's been some discussion about waiting because of lawsuits in other districts. And I want to sort of put my foot down firmly and say, I don't think we can wait. You know, Maryland has, Maryland State Department of Ed has guidance. Um, there are attorneys, you know, from across the country, psychological experts, legal experts. There are policies not only in Maryland, but in states all around the country. They have not all been subject to legal challenges. 
um, they, they're working. They're working for parents, for teachers, for principals, and I don't think we need to wait on something saying, well, we might be sued for it, so we're not going to do it. Um, I think we cross that bridge when we come to it. And in the meantime, the idea that children are being bullied at school, misgendered at school, um, you know, not having their rights respected from everything from what name they're called to where, what facilities they use is unacceptable. So I guess I just wanted to take a moment to say I feel this is urgent. I feel there's plenty of precedents for us to work on. Um, I don't think we need to wait it, due to the fact that we could be sued. Um, and I'm happy to provide any additional resources, you know, additional examples of, of sample policies that might be required. Thank you. Did you want to thank you? <laughs> we can you really, the really hear you due to static, so <laughs> she uh, always knows mind. best. <laughs> want, want to hold it, hold it closer to you. Thank you. Closer to your mouth. Thank you. Okay. So I think also, you know, on the legal side of things, you know, um, the law does cover. Um, discrimination based on sex and I think that does cover a lot of transgender things so I think you know the lawsuit could go e either way like we could also be sued for not meeting the the rights of our transgender and gender not conforming students so I think looking at it that way like we have an obligation to step up the bar to make sure that people do know what to do and I think just in a lot of schools people really don't and when GLSEN came to our school and just taught about vocabulary and <laughs> terminology that really helped people tremendously because they honestly just didn't know um, and so I know GLSEN has numerous times like volunteered to they do it for free they do the training so I mean if we could develop a real schedule and an and implementation plan for making sure that every school gets that training and knows um, how to communicate about the rights of the kids to all these staff members that I think that that would be really important so, thank you. I know our um, time expired. Could I add one thing? Um, in order to prepare for Eli's transition, we did a series, t two days of lessons, that's all. Um, two books and two activities that were vetted by our principal and by a team of teachers and by our school psychologist. Those two lessons are now being used in multiple grade levels, in multiple schools, including private schools who have come to us and said, we need those resources, we need to know what to do to teach people um, what the issues are, what the appropriate behavior is. Yeah, I know it's exciting. So you know, it's it's not rocket science, and it's it's been proven now in our district, in our school, in other places to create a sense of community and understanding on these issues. So again, I think we need to educate people, and that's what we're asking for. Am I a celebrity now? <laughs> I just wanted to clarify, the representation was not that we weren't doing anything, and I don't want you to get that impression. I saw you walk in, so you missed some of the discussion. We spoke very positively about education for school-based staff. We spoke about adding certain language regarding gender expression in the current policy, which is entitled, I think, sex discrimination. Yep, so we thought I've of that actions that we could take. Again, I'll just reiterate, that is not an indication that we don't take the issue seriously and that we're not addressing it. I think there are multiple ways that the board can address your concerns, mm -hmm. um, even if it's not set in a policy. And I think that the board has demonstrated and continues to demonstrate that that's exactly what they want to do. I don't think you've actually seen the right draft because mm -hmm. we, we, at the last board meeting, agreed to go to a third reader for the policy. So the draft okay. that you have read is not the draft policy that we are working on right now. We are working on another version of that. Oh, we brought great. forward to the third reader so that we can at least yeah. so no one, think So no one outside the board has seen it? It's, it has to be drafted. It's not drafted okay. yet. Okay. Great. So you haven't seen it yet because it's not prepared. What the, okay. what the board's instruction was at Tuesday's meeting mm -hmm. was that the second reader, we were not satisfied with the way it would looked currently, okay. and asked staff to go back and work on it. I haven't seen it, right? So it's about it's a work in progress. It'll come back to the board for consideration, and then it'll be voted on at the whatever meeting we have time out. I can't think of the top of my head. But we will. Um, one, one thing I want to note, we haven't talked about this, but I think the idea of education and it needs to be in the regs very clearly. And I don't know if we've talked about that specifically. Mm -hmm. um, even if we don't go, what I was saying earlier, this is preclude us from having to go to a full policy. If we if we ta decide to add language to this policy now, mm -hmm. it does not preclude us from bringing this policy up again even right. this year right. and having another policy that comes forward. Right. But in the meantime, if we're going to do that, I would love us to look at the regs to make sure that what you've just identified as well around education and how we work with our staff and our schools and the language we use for students and that kind of thing be called out in the regs very clearly. Yes. Okay. 
we will revisit it, but there is section F, um, which references training. And just by way of summary, it states on an annual basis, <clears throat> excuse me, every school shall publish and disseminate a summary of the policy and its administrative regulation, as well as the contact information for Title IX coordinator and an age appropriate language for students so that it's clearly and easily understood. Summary shall also be included in all handbooks, this code of student conduct and other annual publications. A link is to be established and prominently displayed on the home web page as well as each school's website and then each in-service training shall be provided, excuse me, to all school-based administrators by the Office of EEO and Title IX Compliance. Um, and it then just talks about the responsibility of individual students. So we can certain staff, I'm sorry. But I, I think so that's can, training on what the policy says, not on like transgender yeah. rights and what that means in practice, right? right? So I was going to say what sorry. we can do is revisit this language in light of some of the comments that have been offered today mm -hmm. and update it before any future presentation yes. to the board. Yeah, that'd okay. be great. Thank that's you. Great. Thank Thanks you. for asking the kids to come and wanting to hear from them directly and for taking into consideration what they had to say. It means I never a lot. I tell kids no. I'm sorry. <laughs> it means That's a lot why to we're, them. They're our clients. I, I work for them. And they're it's, awesome. Yeah. There's that. They're awesome. Yeah. <laughs> right. And just Thank you. One last point of clarification before you ladies leave. I think there will have to be a discussion with Dr. Sandalisis and the academic side of the house on the curricular piece. We, on the curricular yeah. piece and whether it goes with regard to training in the sex-based discrimination policy or whether, or whether it, goes, it goes in the curriculum policy. Yeah, I, I would just appreciate feedback on that Okay, when we know we're working. I think the thing that I was saying, whether at some point I'd love to get to a curricular piece, but the education for principals and teachers. It wasn't your comment. It was okay. a student's Great. comment about okay. curriculum Great. what's taught in health class okay. around I safe sex practices. The I said. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, last, I will allow Ken Juretsu to testify. And normally we do require, you know, ahead of time sign up, but because we have extra time, I'm allowing it the, the pertinency of the discussion, so. Okay, I got the email last minute, and it wasn't very thorough when yeah. I got it from um Mr. I don't like any confusion, Clarence. so I just said, let's go ahead and do it. We have time to do it, so oh, it's okay. perfect. Okay. Okay? Um, you have three minutes. Introduce yourself, please. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Mr. Ken Jirisu. Um, I am a parent um, in Baltimore City uh, of students who are in Baltimore I'm City. I'm sorry. The microphone gets a little bit closer so we can hear you. Sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Is this better? That's great. Okay. Um, hello. My name is Mr. Ken Jirisu. Um I'm a parent of two students who are in the Baltimore City public school system. I am also um, a community advocate. I'm a program director working at Hearts and Ears, um, which is the only LGBT mental health and wellness uh, center in Baltimore City in the state of Maryland, actually. Um, I attended uh, the PCAB meeting when they spoke about the policies, um, especially in regards to uh, the Title IX policy, and I had some concerns, and I did ask questions. Um, one of my questions was in regards to the training, um, that, uh, the training piece and where the training was coming from uh, in regards to staff uh, taking the training for it to be, uh, for it to per se trickle down to the uh, principals and to the teachers because um, uh, when I get the answer that I got was uh, that they reached out to the GLCCB and there were a couple there were very few organizations that they knew about um, and I had, had to kind of reach down into my bag and give a list of agencies that oh, organizations LGBT organizations that are here in Baltimore City that apparently nobody knows about um, our organization is one of them, um, where we do uh, LGBT trainings, transgender 101, as we call it, uh, for individuals who don't quite understand the fullness of um, the issues that the transgender community uh, deals with. Uh, some of the things that I heard with the students um, that spoke was uh, issues in regards to um, just something simple as health class um, and being able to get that information and not have to worry about uh, being discriminated against sitting in a classroom to, you know, to talk about um, something as simple as safe sex. Um, when it comes to uh, another concern that I had was in regards to um, 
LGBT liaison or a parent liaison that is very knowledgeable or someone who is knowledgeable with the LGBT community when it comes to issues that arise uh, not only with the students, but the parents who happen to be the stakeholders and also participate in the school system. Myself being a transgender parent, I get uh, deal with being misgendered in the schools when I come in. Um, I have a child who is um, under the LGBT umbrella who is special needs at an all special needs school and they refuse to even discuss the issue um, when I dealt with being misgendered and I had to deal with the parent. The, the vice principal brushed it under the rug and came up with another issue that it was supposed to be about. So. Um, my thing is when it comes to the trainings and things that are put in place or things that are put in the policy, um, will things be included to protect um, not only the students or to train uh, train staff, but to um, a piece that will also protect the parents as well who come in like myself, who are engaged in the school and who care about their children's welfare, but shouldn't have to worry about coming in and being disrespected. So, I mean, there's a number of things, but I know that my time has expired, but I would love to sit down and talk to someone just to get those ideas out. There are a lot of things, a lot of concerns, so. So I, I appreciate, I don't want to add anything, but I appreciate the fact that you call attention to the parents' mm -hmm. engagement. We didn't even talk about that as part of the policy and how we engage. Out, well, I don't even know if the policy addresses it directly. We should think about how pa parents are engaged in the schools. If you can, I'm, I appreciate you not naming the particular schools that you're talking about on, my, on the microphone, mm -hmm. but I would appreciate it if you would share it with the staff after the meeting mm -hmm. so they can talk to the school directly about addressing that issue that you've had with your own child at the school because that's not acceptable and we'll deal with that offline, obviously, because it's, it's a student and a personnel issue we can't talk about publicly, but I appreciate mm -hmm. you sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's a... Uh, we don't have another, would we have another way right now we're collecting information and feedback on the policy and what we'd like to see happen because we're asking to have a sit down conversation but we don't, what's the, what's the next step for us in policy generation? So, oh, microphone Tammy, sorry. A follow up meeting with PCAB. I okay. don't know that a date has been selected as of yet. No. 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 Okay. But prior to third reader, we'll have another PCAB opportunity mm -hmm. that will be sent out. But there's also the, what's the policy website? The, the policy review. The website is policy review at bcps.k12.md.us. And that comes directly to the board. They will see that feedback. So all the concerns that you have, you can outline and then send that to us as well. In addition to sort of voicing concerns in person at the PCAP meeting. Okay. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That concludes public comment. Um, we are adjourned. The next policy meeting, do you know when it is, Tanisha? Yes, November 20th. Go ahead. Go ahead. The next policy committee meeting will be November 21st at 3.30, and we will meet here. Okay. We are adjourned. Does the motion to open the closure again? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, technically, yes. Yes. Support meeting. Can I have a motion to close the meeting? <laughs> I didn't open it, but we can close it. <laughs> so moved. So moved. Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. All right, we're closed. <laughs> Thank you. The investigators are here.